Hello, everybody. Welcome to our third weekly Mondo Conversations with the Guild of Music Supervisors. Welcome uh, around the United States and around the world. We have an amazing panel once again. Very proud to partner not only this time with Guild of Music Supervisors, but our new partner, Variety. Um, so uh, thrilled to have them on board. And I want to uh, also, I'm here in New York with my partner, Joanne Abbott-Green. Hello, Joel. Hello, John. Hello, panel. We're going to open up a little differently today. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Joel C. High. Joel is a music supervisor on just a few films, about 150, plus hours and hours of TV, games, so on and so forth. Joel is the former head of music for Trimark Pictures and Lionsgate Film and Television. He is also Tyler Perry's music supervisor, and he's currently president of the Guild of Music Supervisors. I think uh, Joel's in LA today. I hope uh, you're on, Joel. I'd like to throw it to you. Again, thank you, everybody, and enjoy the panel. Joel's muted, Bobby. Got to unmute. All right, well, until, gets Joel, until Joel gets unmuted, I will kick in. Uh, my name is Jonathan McHugh. I'm the co-founding, one of the co-founding members of the Guild of Music Supervisors. And um, Joel is the president who's stuck on mute at the moment. We'll be off momentarily. Uh, anyway, we, we started this panel series about three weeks ago, and it's got a tremendous amount of uh, buy-in. We've had great articles in uh, uh, Billboard. And oh, there we go. And now we have Bright as a partner. So Joel's going to uh, jump in and keep going. <laughs> Thank you. They're wisely put muzzling me. And I, I think that was a good move for now. So thank you, Robert. I appreciate this. And I'm really enjoying this partnership. The The Guild is uh, definitely, this is something that sprung out of necessity. And um, we're hoping to make it a big thing. Um, you know, McHugh here, uh, one of the founding board members, this was one of his brainchilds. And we're, we're kind of leaping in with both feet to keep making this happen. I'm really happy to be uh, to have this panel today um, about showrunners and their music supervisors and the relationships there, and to have two fellow board members who are uh, panelists on that, John McHugh and Madonna Wade Reed, who's also vice president for the Guild. So I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. Um, really quickly, a little housekeeping. You know, we're going to be continuing these. We have another one coming up next week, which I'm really excited about. It's about the advertising community and specifically emphasizing the East Coast group and the board of directors for the Guild of Music Supervisors just this past week uh, authorized um, a full committee that is representing East Coast concerns, specifically New York. And in this time when New York is feeling the, the COVID crisis more than anybody else in this country, um, we're gonna be hearing from them and some of their specific concerns about this. So next week, be sure to tune in. Um, and I'm really excited about this new committee. So uh, I'm going to hand it off to, uh, real quick too, we're going to be doing a lot more of these panels. Um, also, we're trying to look at seminars and maybe even some, some entertainment and some kind of get togethers for members. So make sure you join the guild and be part of this uh, growing kind of endeavor. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to our host for the day, the moderator, Jazzed. Tanke, who's uh, with Variety, she's the artisan editor, um, and hopefully she'll explain exactly what that is, but I know that means that music supervisors are part of her beat, um, so she uh, covers the crafts industry across the new news organizations, print, digital, and video platforms, and will be our, monitor, our moderator for today, so I will hand it off to Az. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Joel, and thank you, everybody. I'm so excited, first of all, to be here. So thank you so much for having me and Variety. Um, Jonathan and I have been partners in crime covering the red carpet with the Guild of Music Supervisors. So, um, you know, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and learn from you today. Um, so, yeah, just in a nutshell, as the artisan's editor, my job is to speak to everybody below the line and give you guys a lot of love and a lot of um, you know, attention and to hear your stories. Um, you know, we all love the A-listers and our directors, but, you know, you also, t you know, tell a big part of the story that we see on screen too. So um, 
So let's kick this off and thank you again to everybody joining. Um, let's kick this off by a quick introduction. Everybody, let's just go around um, telling us what you do. We've got music supervisors and showrunners. So talk about the last project that you know you worked on and who you are. So let's start with Jonathan at the top. Hi, Jazz. Yes. Yeah, so my name is Jonathan McHugh. Uh, as we talked about, founding guild uh, member. Uh, we started the organization about ten years ago, and it's been a great, great boon to keep it working. And it's great to have a partnership with uh, both Variety, uh, where we did the award show, and with Mondo, where we do our annual education event in October. God willing, we'll do it again this year for our third annual. Uh, yeah, I've been an independent music supervisor for a long time. I've moved into also film producing and film directing. Uh, and it's been an amazing run. Um, shows wise, I you know do a variety of independent films and, and TV. Uh, the newest show I'm, I'm working on is with Alan Friedland, who's been a longtime friend. Uh, and he uh, is involved with a really cool show that he'll, he'll talk about and we'll talk about the music for that. So I'm gonna pass the ball down to Alan Friedland while we're talking and then he can just keep rolling around the Zoom room. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny Mac. Uh, my name is Alan Friedland. I am a writer, uh, Nick producer, and showrunner. Um, working TV and movies. Uh, in movies, uh, wrote the movie Due Date, uh, starring uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Zach Galifianakis with Todd Phillips directing. And uh, in TV, which is mostly my bread and butter, um, uh, done live action and animation, a lot of animation. Um, started out on King of the Hill for many, many years, uh, did American Dad. And then the show that John refers to, uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later, is called The Fabulous Freak Brothers, based on an old uh, comic book series that is being uh, put together and will be out uh, in 2020 that we can talk about a little bit later. Madonna? Hi. Uh, Madonna Wade Reed. I'm a music supervisor. Obviously, here today, most proud of uh, All American, which has been. Um, a dream job that I've been working on. I also uh, supervise Batwoman, and before these two shows, I did American Crime, I did Rain, I did The Red Line. Um, anyone who's been watching TV for over 15 years will maybe know that uh, my previous business partner and I worked on Felicity. I did eight out of 10 years on Smallville, so. I've been hacking away in the music business for a long time. <laughs> and who's your partner in crime? Well, I had one many years ago. Now I'm just, it's me, myself, and I, and a set of headphones, and we're getting the job done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. NK, let's go down to you. Hi, I am uh, NK G. Carroll. I go by NK. I am a writer, executive producer, and showrunner. Um, currently the showrunner on All American. We uh, just started our season three through a virtual writer's room, which is a whole experience. I really <laughs> missed my whiteboard. Um, and uh, prior to that, uh, I've worked on shows, um, The Resident, Rosewood, Bones, it's kind of where I grew up. Um, the Finder, which was the Bones spinoff with uh, Michael Clark Duncan and Jeff Stoltz. Um, and, uh, prior to that, I had a whole different career. I was an economist for the Federal Reserve for 14 years, just made a slight career change, gave my mom a heart attack. It was all great. <laughs> um, and, uh, yes, I get to work with the wonderful Madonna, um, constantly. Her phone is always ringing. She'll tell you about it. Um, uh, but I'm really happy to be here. Thank you guys for having us. All right, Spencer, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Spencer Pacinger. I'm technically real Spencer on set and around the office of All-American. I'm currently a producer on All-American, and before that, I played seven years in the NFL. I uh, won a Super Bowl my first year with the New York Giants. Played there four Giants. years. There you go. Uh, played there four years with the Giants, two years with the Miami Dolphins, and retired when I was with the Carolina Panthers the 2017-18 season because that's when we got word that All-American was at least getting a pilot order. So, you know, I'm young in this industry, only about two years old in this industry, still learning, uh, wanting to dive into writing and directing in the future, but just happy to be here today. Okay, Jason? Hi, I'm Jason uh, Kadams. I um, haven't spent as much time in the, in the NFL, uh, <laughs> but played a little bit, played a couple seasons. 
No. What I, tennis I, court uh, man? You're... I do not. I'm a, I think I've tackled you before. I'm a writer and a showrunner, and I'm really here today to uh, talk about uh, working with Liza Richardson. We've been uh, working together for many years now. Uh, um, she's been, I started working with her uh, doing Friday Night Lights and have worked with her, I think, on every show that I've uh, worked on since then. And Liza. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm Liza, and this is really nice of you guys to have us. It's a beautiful day. Thanks, Jason. And I just love working with Jason Kadams. I think Jason gave me my very first TV opportunity, which was Friday Night Lights. And uh, that ha is pretty much still like the, you know, one of my all time favorite projects of all time. And um, uh, more recently, uh, Watchmen on HBO, The Morning Show on Apple and, you know, Narcos, and uh, just finished 10 uh, seasons of Hawaii Five Up. <laughs> so trying to keep busy during this weird time, but, uh, you know, see what happens. And, you know, on the subject of it being a weird time, here we are all in quarantine. Um, let's talk about how COVID-19 coronavirus has impacted you all. Like, are any of you working right now? Or like, you know, what? how are you all doing? What's going on with you? Um, I can start. Um, I, uh, we are working right now. My writer's room had uh, just started. We've been at it for a couple of weeks when the zombie apocalypse, as I like to refer to it, because it makes me feel better, um, happened. And so we moved into a virtual writer's room and uh, just continued working. And, and honestly, it's sort of the one thing keeping my writers and I sane. It's the one thing we're like, okay, we understand this. This feels normal breaking story. And so we all kind of wanted to keep going um, for a while and knock out a few episodes, you know, episodes that we're sure we'll have to rewrite in some capacity once we know when we're going back to production, how we're going back to production, um, you know, what will be allowed, what won't be allowed. We're a teen show, people make out. Not really sure how that's gonna happen. Um, but, uh, but until people way smarter than me um, figure out the logistics of how we're gonna return back, we're sort of just moving forward with crafting the story and uh, moving forward with uh, Shape in a season three that we're, just excited to film at some point. Uh, I'll jump in. We're, uh, the Freak Brothers is an animated show. So uh, we were, the animation takes a long time. Uh, the writing had been done. Uh, there's always some rewriting uh, through various steps of the process and we're still doing a little bit of that, but a lot of it was um, getting the animation and doing a lot of the editing and, and rewrites the animation. So we're lucky, I guess, in the sense that we can continue to do the animation from various places and it's a little slower but uh the train is is still inching along forward yeah what about for you jason uh we've been working on um a show uh for netflix um called away and uh we were already finished shooting and we've been in post-production it's a very uh heavy uh, visual effects show so and most of that is as we've been continued to be able to, you know, um, continue to work a lot, you know, because a lot of that stuff can be done from home remotely. Uh, same thing with our, uh, the um, composing, the composer is able to work from home. So we've kind of have been able to do everything other than the final step of getting everybody back, getting everybody into the, into the mix. And um, we're, have pushed the mixes back um, and we'll continue to push them back until we can't push them back any longer. And then we'll figure out, you know, um, uh, how to do that in this, in a, in a safe way. And so, um, so mainly that's what we've been, uh, doing. Luckily we were not, it's not, we were not at the stage where we were shut down in the middle of production. Like we were able, we we're able to, we'll be able to finish the season. It'll take us a lot longer, but we'll be able to do it. And then aside from that, I'm, um, you know, I was in that the process of sort of starting on new projects and developing. And so that kind of continues. Yeah. Jonathan, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, as being the founder of the Guild of Music Supervisors, like how, you know, 
you've been handling things during quarantine and coronavirus and also you know if you've been putting tunes together like what's been going on with you uh, I mean, it's it's interesting in the respect that, you know, like Alan and I just had the show that we've been working on for probably three, four months, and it's just kind of coming together to start. And then I have two films that I'm finishing um, that are in different stages of clearance. And what's good about it is, you know, the music business is fully running in the sense that the publishers and the master owners are working, and they're actually much quicker to get back to you now because yeah. they have less to do. Um, <laughs> And they've seemed to be more interested in getting clearances uh, done. Like I've had one guy keep emailing me like, hey, you ready to pay me yet? You ready to pay me yet? I'm like, no, no, not yet. We're having a log picture yet, but we're about to. So <laughs> it's it's an interesting time uh, for everybody. And, the, you know, the downside is that if you don't have projects, um, you're not as busy. But again, our world is, part of it is finding that time to listen to music, to be able to put that away somewhere and know where it's going to go. And obviously when you have a certain project that you're targeting music for, you know, like right now I'm going to search for gypsy music, literally traditional music from Bulgaria. And you have all these random people you find on Facebook or you're tracking them down and they, they introduce you to another gyp real gypsy and they'll send you a video of them dancing traditional gypsy music. And one guy was actually from Bulgaria, introduced me to a guy in Japan who owned the masters that I need to license which was basically just a YouTube clip that the director loved. So, you know, a lot of what we do is forensics and trying to find uh, the music that our showrunners and directors want. And then we pitch them other things that when we obviously can't get to it. Uh, Alan's show right now, we're actually launching what we call a mini, which is a short version of uh, the show that's gonna go up in a couple of weeks. And we're working on last minute clearances for that. Um, so the, you know, and again, the, like I said, the labels and publishers have been very receptive. So again, it's it's all about what the future is going to hold. And if there's going to be a lag in production, uh, whether, you know, obviously what the, how are going to work on that music. So that's obviously a worry for everybody and, and everybody trying to figure out how to make a living right now. Very tough time for everybody. Um, so we embrace the music and, and the project we work on and we feel blessed to do what we do. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that one of the craziest uh phenomena that's happening. I was talking to a few supervisors this morning is, you know, uh, Fridays is normally release day. Supervisors are accustomed to your inbox gets flooded of all the new releases. It is like new release day every day. I am getting so much music that I'll, I will just apologize to the universe that I don't even know how I'm going to listen to it all. It's every single day, you know, at some of us still are wrapping up some projects. So we actually have some of our work work to do, but when we're not addressing that stuff, we do take the time to listen to music and the amount of stuff that we're getting is just a response to the people who pitch the music, having a little more time on their hand. I may or may not have a 150 playlists that are solely like, we're going to get through this. <laughs> yes, there's a lot, there's coming a lot out of tomorrow. happy, yeah, a lot of happy, uh, we're going to get through these moments, playlists coming in. I got you. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of amazing. Like, I am I have a folder that I'm, I'm just afraid of it. <laughs> oh, I have a comment on that, Madonna. Um, I, I was talking to some friends that are in the live music business and that, there is less music being released because artists can't tour, so they're holding their albums back. So I don't know. Um, I, I feel like, yeah, there's always a lot of music and maybe everybody's catching up and, um, you know, they are putting together their we're in this together playlist, but uh, totally. So, you know, you're talking about having, you know, what, 150 pitches a day. What is it? You know, I get pitches too for people who want to write articles and I'm like, you know, there's the one sentence pitch and then there's the long, well-researched. Like, what would stand out for you right now as producers, as music supervisors for, you know, people who have music to submit to you? Putting my name on the email? I mean, that's a good place to start. Like the right name? Know where you sent it. You know, I think... Supervisors are a broken record of, you know, we're open to receiving music from non-traditional 
ways and independence and stuff, but you want to at least be shown the respect that somebody did just a little bit of homework. So when I receive an email from someone I don't know, of course, the first question is, how'd you get my email? And then the second question is, as I start to read it is, are you sending this for your benefit, my benefit, our mutual benefit? Like somebody sends me an email and it's clear that they haven't even Googled a minimum of what we're working on. Like, I don't like, I don't have a lot of use for Polka right now. So don't send, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, the, the research I think is super important, right? You have to, if you're out there pitching music to us, you have to have no, okay, where's Madonna at in this all American season? Where, where is she? Is she actually doing music right now for it? And if so, then maybe it's, it's topical, but if not, you know, you, you need to know. And, and IMDB, I guess would be the best resource. I mean, a variety production log, uh, things like that, where you're updating on what shows people are on and where they're at in their shows. That's the most important thing for people pitching music, I think. Be educated and do your research. Oh, uh, John? Yes, ma'am. You know, I, I don't know if I need that. Like, I, I feel like pitchers should just send me their priorities and and then like, you know, I don't, I don't really expect them to know what I'm doing or how to figure it out because I don't broadcast. Like, I don't like put it out there, uh, like all my projects, but I mean, you know, I guess it's annoying sometimes when you, when you get an email and they say, Hey, this is for parenthood. And I'm like, well, that was a long time ago, <laughs> but, um, but, but new stuff, I think it's really hard for people to keep up. So my, my policy is more like, Send me some stuff and, you know, we'll go through it. We may not get back to you, but um, we'll definitely do our best to, to get through the music. Yeah. And Jonathan, you touched on it earlier. Like, you know, you went looking, you know, for Gypsy Music on Facebook. What other platforms or social media? I mean, TikTok has exploded in quarantine. Um, so where are you all looking for, like, new artists and new music now that there seems, yeah, talk about well, I have an annual source in my house. I have two, two three teenagers, and a, two teenagers and a, uh, no, one teenager and some 20, early 20-somethings, and they're always constantly turning me on to new music. So that's really nice because we can swap old, I give them old school stuff, and they're like, who are the specials, Dad? And they're like, oh, my God, I love the specials. So, uh, but they, every day, they turn me on to music, and then obviously the Instagrams and, you know, the TikToks, and um, I think there's just so much amazing music out there flowing, and it's really a question of how do we, funnel it all and channel it um but i'll let that go around the room and also i would also throw that out to the showrunners like where do they get their music from besides supervisors because i think that's also interesting yeah i mean actually my source is very similar to your source jonathan is my 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 team um is uh a, a huge source of where we get music from and we're actually a very we let we have a lot of dance battles in the house uh, my husband and i are very competitive with the kids about that um so we we actually do listen to a lot of music and um you know i, I guess some of it is a byproduct of how i was raised there's sort of like a huge genre of music that goes across the house so like if you if you pulled up you know, my iPhone right now, it's everything from the Mamas and the Papas to The Cure to Tupac to the Baby. It just really depends on, I'm very schizophrenic music listener. Um, so it just kind of depends on the mood I'm in. And so that ends up being a lot of source. So, you know, on All American, you'll see, you know, some of this is, um, you know, Madonna does beautifully is it'll, we'll end up using a song that is so against type for the scene and the location and the people in it. And they're like, wait, you're using Sean Mendes for a Crenshaw scene about two kids from the hood. And it's like, yeah, we are. Um, and it works. And part of that is just kind of our love for all these different genres. And so, and then, yeah, I like to think I'm keeping up with my team, but truthfully, he's the one that's sort of putting me on to a lot of new stuff. And, and our show is very youthful. And so we try to find um, ways to sort of keep current while keeping true to the, to the heart of what the show is. Just one compliment to you before we move on is that my daughter basically started binging your show and she's like, dad, you know, I've never watched a CW show in my life. Right. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> really good. And so it's just amazing that you guys executed so well. And the fact that Spencer, you know, uh, coming from a real story, it just makes it that much better, I guess. But it's, you know, again, I would think the music, you know, you're right. You have to have a lot of good music heads in there because that show has to be, super contemporary when it comes to the music wise because you're dealing with you know 
top of the line high school kids with their, you know, who are super musical. Um, thank you. Thank you. Tell your uh, daughter we appreciate her watching. Absolutely. Um, I can say that before all of this happened, one of my sort of secret ways that I like to discover um, new music outside of all the, you know, I can get lost in a Spotify playlist for three hours. But one of my favorite things that I, I view as a treat to myself is that when I'm going to a, a show, um, I try and finish up my work day in time to sometimes see the opening act, which chances are maybe I've never heard of. Like that is my favorite thing to just show up with zero expectations and just get so excited and be so surprised by, at least for me, what's become a new discovery. And then I am the supervisor who will demand that somebody take me to meet the artist. And I'll just be like, oh, I just, I came early and I saw you and I need your music. And they're like, uh, okay. And I will, I will go and I will buy the CD or I will buy the vinyl and I will track down who I need to track down. I've been to concerts with her and it is everything she's saying and I know is true. <laughs> we're, so, we're like the biggest music heads. If, if Spencer and I are on set, it's like no one else is there. We <laughs> just want to talk music. What gig should we plan to go to? We double date with our spouses. Oh yeah. He is, and he, by the way, is a really important source for me. What, what I never lose sight of is it is an absolute privilege when you are working on a project that is based on a real person to have that real person there and even though we are focused on a part of his life that precedes who he is now my favorite thing to do with Spencer is when I am talking to him about music and we're talking about what we like is I take note of what he likes because it's a part of who he is and even though who he is now isn't fully who he was then, I try to plant the seeds based on what he likes because it just gives me one more layer of who he is as a person. So if I can put a musical voice to who he was developing to become, it's a godsend that he's right there. And I'm just like, knock, 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 question, 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 question. Yeah. It's a blessing. I I'm obsessed with the dynamics um, between Spencer and Cooper on the show and that sound, that distinct sound that you created, it's, it's incredible. So talk about, you know, you were just talking about it, but the conversations you, you know, the three of you had about putting this music together to create the distinct soundscape of All American. Well, we don't have a lot of rules. That's, that's the first thing. Um, there's a moment once a week when we have a spotting session and NK and I are in the same room and usually it starts off with something like, I believe one of the last ones I walked in, I was like, oh my God, have you listened to the new Harry Styles album? I think there's stuff in there that we can use. We have no rules and we just take from everywhere around us what we like, what our castmates like. We pay an incredible amount of attention to our fans. We listen to them, we look at what they're listening to, and sometimes a fan's music ends up in the show. I mean, and we're wide open. Absolutely, and there's also a lot of trust, you know, I, I, I really do trust Madonna, and we'll have like discussions and, and, um, and arguments over tracks and, and the amount that the track costs. And I'm like, I know, but we really want it. Um, but <laughs> what's great is because there is that trust there, I can sit down with her and I do this at the start of every season and I'll sit down and be like, okay, these are the storylines we're doing. These are sort of the big tentpole moments that I can tell you now, even though those scripts aren't written, episode seven, this is there's gonna be a cabin episode and this is gonna happen. Or, you know, episode 14, we're really building to sort of this crescendo in Coop and Spencer's relationship. And God bless Madonna, even with that little information, she will go away and then come back and be like, I know you haven't met in the episode yet. Before that episode, you told me where such and such happens, just listen to this. And that's before I've even put, you know, fingers to keyboard. Um, and so there's that sort of dialogue and trust that goes back and forth so that, you know, it just, the music really is another character on the show that, you know, I take into consideration the same way I do all the other characters we write. Um, and Madonna is just kind of our, our partner in that. And she 
um, is so great about like, I know this doesn't seem like the typical thing we do, but listen to this or listen to that. Um, and we end up having these long discussions about artists that we both love and didn't realize that we both loved. And um, all of that ends up, ends up on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if, if I have a second, I think outside of, you know, people wanting to know who my wife is depicted as in the show, uh, I get a lot of compliments about the music uh, selection. And it's anywhere from, you know, a 13 year old high schooler to a 65 year old, you know, grandfather. So it's just a testament to, you know, Madonna and NK and just the trust that they have for each other in song selection. Yeah. I have to say on the, uh, when we were shooting the pilot, I was sitting on set and I I'd not met Spencer. I was just like, somebody introduced me to him and no one had introduced me. And he was, you were sitting behind me and you were having a music discussion. And yeah. I looked at Charles and I was like, God damn it, introduce me. I want in on the <laughs> conversation. And you were talking about like all the different sounds that you envisioned for the series. And so when I finally burst into the conversation, at one point you were like, you know, like, I like Frank Ocean. I like Duckworth. And I was like, they're both tempted in. <laughs> both tempted in. And then I turned around and when we were in post and we were working on the episodes and people are throwing around ideas about what should we replace? What can we change? And I was like, we are not touching the Calvin Harris song with Frank Ocean and we are not touching Duckworth. End of story. End of discussion. And Anything else you want. But those are his choices. And that's what I mean when I say it was so important that I had him to tap for information and just put it there now in the context of what we're doing today. And mind you, that conversation was started and stopped it about for four hours, I want to say. So yeah. it was a it was a lengthy one. So talk about securing, you know, songs like by, you know, Frank Ocean. You know, Jason, we'll talk about Rise in a second, but like, you know, when you've got like Snoop or, you know, a huge artist, like getting clearance for music, like from big artists versus getting it from small artists, like fill us in on that, that process and that. Well, what goes into that? Hip hop. Hip hop is its own, it's, it's its own special thing, we shall say. Um, and Oftentimes there's a lot more songwriters involved in pop and hip hop. And so our, our clearance challenges are great. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many runs we had to take at Nipsey Hussle and how many people we had to get involved, but we were determined to have him in the pilot. We were determined, you know, to have him after his passing open our second season but songs like that, that have a lot of moving parts, they're just, they're always challenging just because you have to get everybody on board. In the case of season two, you know, we had to be very respectful of the family and make sure that what we were doing honored them, just all of those things. But there just isn't, and it, I mean, it happens in all the genres, there isn't always the tightest paperwork. And so it is just really challenging. And if I'm trying to flip an episode in a week and a half, um, yeah, I mean, I've cleared stuff on text where the answer was three words, and my answer was, put it on the paper, send it back. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't send Warner Brothers your text. <laughs> I'd like to, but I can't. So it's challenging, but it's challenging in a great way because I have these people that I want so badly to please and so badly not to let down. I do some crazy shit to get it done. Yeah. I'll stay up late to call England if that's what I need to do to talk to somebody. Like, I love them too much. I never want them to be disappointed. I never want to go in the room and say, you can't have it. You know, so I do what I do. I'm a, I'm a little relentless, so, but it's part we of the job. Have, it has to be. It's part of the job description, relentless. Jason spent an entire series in Rise, you know, Ch tackling spring awakening so talk mm -hmm. about you know why spring awakening yeah. i mean we're all obsessed with it but what goes into clear broadway musical we're not just talking one song we're talking about an entire you know production yeah well you know that so rise was it was it was based on a um real story about this guy named lou volpe who was a 
teacher, a high school drama teacher in Pennsylvania who wound up, you know, um, doing this. And it was, it was kind of like a small, small town school. It was a very, it was, it, it was not a glamorous drama program. It was kind of a working class area. And he wound up directing these incredible productions that got national attention. And the reason why we wanted Spring Awakening is that was one of his main, that was, that was one of the, the musicals that he produced that uh, he was, he, he did the first high school production of that show. And it was um, a really important show for that theater. And, um, and so we really wanted that. Like when I was writing the pilot, you know, we had, you know, that was like a big decision to what show it would be. And I wrote it as Spring Awakening. And then after I wrote it that way, then we had to figure out um, what it would take to clear it. And um, it's, it was so beyond any, any kind of clearance issue that I have ever dealt with in, 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 in um, the normal course of like um, clearing songs. Um, it was a major undertaking. I mean, every, you know, you're, clearing not only the rights to the <clears throat> songs themselves, but the dialogue, the music, the direction, the costumes, all of these people who were involved in the original production have to approve it and then it has to be negotiated. And uh, it was a really long process, but I have to say <clears throat> the reason why I think we got it, and, and by the way, I wrote it and we start, and we were well into prepping the show before the rights were, you know, cleared. And so I, the further we got, the more, <clears throat> if we didn't get them, we'd be in trouble because you'd be sort of, the train leaves the station at a certain point. <clears throat> and, um, but I think the thing that was key was, you know, I went to New York and I met with Steve Sater, um, who wrote the show uh, along with Duncan Sheik. And um, he wrote, uh, uh, you know, Stephen wrote the, the book and the lyrics. And um, it was that relationship with him and later with Duncan that I felt like they believed in the show that we were doing and they had confidence in it. And I think ultimately that was, a, that was what made it work. And I, got, I went to, I had never seen Spring Awakening. Um, <clears throat> and so we went to um, the library near Lincoln Center where, they, where you can like rent all, where you can not rent, you can view all of the, you know, all the Broadway shows from the last X amount of years, they have them all in the library. And I went with Steven and we watched it together. And it was like this amazing experience to be sitting there and watching this really sort of seminal work um, next to the creator of that work and really get into, and you know, my job was to sort of get into his head and understand what this show was about for him, what the songs were about, um, what the themes, what, what, why he was exploring these themes. And I think that that relationship really helped kind of, um, you know, um, with, with, with ha helped with ultimately, even though it was a very complicated deal, ultimately getting the, the deal done. Yeah. So has there been a song that any of you, you know, any of you as music supervisors and producers wanted and you've just had a no, like, what's that one, the one song? Go, Eliza. Okay. Um, uh, I find that the most, the hardest part about clearances these days is um, scene content. Um, I feel like I don't know, I, at least on the shows I've been working on, the the material is so like uh, either violent or sexual or race related. And I was working on Watchmen and there's one particular episode where we wanted a Doris Day song. And then there's, you know, the scene description was just, you know, unbelievable, but I, I went through so many letters and writing trying to convince them that this was actually, you know, anti-white supremacist. And, and I, I worked so hard to, to get the song cleared and they just said, sorry, it's not gonna happen. So there are times when, you know, you, 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 you have, as a music supervisor, yeah, you just have to go 
jump over every, you, you, you know, leave no stone unturned. That's your job. Like that's what it's all about is just that digging, 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 just to get that final flat out, no, it's not gonna happen, just move on. And until you get to that point, you know, you kind of don't stop. Uh, my favorite story on that one is, um, I did a movie years ago, uh, and I'm, by the, by the way, the first guy, a little trivia, I'm the first guy to ever put Radiohead in a movie. I found a demo of Creep, and I got it in a movie, a Stephen Dorff movie called SFW, um, and that was many, many, de whatever, that decades ago that was. But So I had a little pride of ownership with Radiohead. Cut to X amount of years later, they obviously stopped licensing uh, that song altogether, even playing that song altogether at their shows. But I was working with a director, I won't mention the name, um, and he had never heard of Radiohead. He was an older British gentleman, but he'd never heard of Radiohead. And this is, you know, five, ten years into their career. Um, but I had a song, called, there was a song called Fake Plastic Trees, which we put into the uh, opening of this movie, and it worked, like, amazing. And I said to him, you know, look, I'm going to just tell you, this is temp. Radiohead doesn't license a lot of stuff. I don't know if we can use it, but... Um, We'll try. So we wrote passionate letters to Radiohead, both myself and the producer, the director, and they had just that they were in that point of their lives where they were just shutting down all licensing. So uh, the moral of the story is I didn't get to use the thing, the song, but the composer came up with a really nice piece that worked out just as well. But the moral of the story is the director never talked to me again. I never worked with him again. So you learn the lessons early on that if you are going to pitch something you should probably have a reasonable facsimile that you can actually get that because there's a disease in this business called temp love and temp love is I put this song in, I want to use it. I got to have it, get it. And sometimes as you know, people will tell you, you just can't get it. Um, it's not about money. Sometimes it's just how things are. Um, so that's my sad story. Moving I on. Can, I, I can balance it with a, with a good yes. You're going to be a happy story. Of the payoff, which yeah. is uh, when I did the series Rain, by the time we got on the air, Lord had already released Royals. And it was just everywhere and everybody loved it. And, you know, I read what the fans say after episodes. And apparently I was just a numb nut for not putting the song in the show. And my thing was, oh, I'm going to hold out and wait till the exact moment that I'm going to drop it on you and you're gonna, your mind will be blown. So we're a few episodes into the series and I'm having lunch with her publisher who says to me, we went through all the new shows with Lord. And um, when we told her about Rain, she got really excited. She said, she loves Mary Queen of Scots. You can use anything you want from the album, except Royals. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, please don't do this to me. I've been waiting to use this. And so when I, I, I realized, like, she's not going to budge. Like, she's not letting anybody use it. It's not just me. She's not letting anyone use it. So I was, my comeback was, well, the Vitamin String Quartet did a cover of it. What about that? And they were like, wait, what? There's a String Quartet cover of it? I send it to the publisher. I guess the publisher sent it to her. And she said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you. I can give you Not a. Taking no for an answer. <laughs> I can give you a uh, uh, real current uh, uh, song we're going after that you know John will say we're not we're not there yet. But uh, in the pilot of the show, uh, there these are three uh, hippies freaks from 1969 who basically uh, fall asleep, uh, smoke some wacky weed at Woodstock, and fall asleep at 50 years and wake up in the year 2020, and they're stuck here. And in the pilot, our guys, again, they're from 69. They don't know what's going on. They see a guy walking down the street. He's got earbuds in, talking on the phone. They think he's talking to him. They follow him back to the apartment, to the guy's apartment, figuring that he is somehow going to tell them how to get back to 69 or what's going on here. And uh, one of our guys' characters, Phineas, is like, says, I, you know, I, I think what's going on here, they're, they're, these people are robots, and I get that. We're living, and they're in this guy's apartment. They said, we're living in the age of the machine. And then the Alexa device goes playing Rage Against the Machine. And then there's a big sequence that goes on with a Rage um, Sleep Now in the Fire song that I've said to John, John, this is an important song for this joke and for this sequence. 
Uh, we're in process. John and I have gone to a Springsteen show and hung out with Tom Morello. I said, hopefully that helps. Um, but, uh, you know, John is banging on doors. And, uh, you know, I said, that one's important. We, uh, yeah, and on that one, you know, I said to Alan, I said, look, you know, your show is a weird show because it's, it's funny, it's great, but it's also independently made for a um, animated series. So as Alan gets ready, to, you know, he's casting it. He's got a bunch of big names lined up. We can't quite announce them yet. And then so when I go back, it's better for me to have that cast. And even if I know a broadcaster where it's going to be, whether it's a Hulu, Netflix, NBC, whatever, that information is better for me to have to go back to Tom and, and his people, Rage, to say, hey, I know you don't license a lot of stuff, but here's a great counterculture you know, uh, piece that loves your music and is going to use it in a great way. So it's a lot of it is about just us being able to convey why they need to do this when they don't normally like to do these things. And it's, uh, it's the classic give and take of it all. So fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> John, talk. I mean, whilst we're talking about the show, like, you know, you're not just covering a single decade. I think you're covering what, 1969 to present. So talk about like what the music palette is for the show when you're covering so many. Yeah, it's a good question. We're starting at the beginning, so we're using stuff like Pete Seeger, um, you know, in the hippie movement, covering some of the hippie stuff. We're using John Fogarty, uh, Creed's Clearwater, Fortunate Son. Um, we're using a version of Watchtower, all on the Watchtower. Um, but then you get into the Jimi Hendrix of it all that doesn't want to license a lot of music, especially when there's drug use and things like that. So it, right now we're still into the period we're about to launch forward into the future where do you get into Rage Against the Machine Land. Um, but as you know, as Alan can talk about, uh, you know, sometimes animation is used, music is used differently. A lot of it's used as comedy. So there are scenes like there was actually a John Lennon song that we were thinking about, but it wasn't quite funny enough for his people because it, you know, had a little weird different use. Um, so, it, you know, you can talk about that, Alan, on, on how in your world and background of using music as comedy and how that can affect the clearances. Yeah, I mean, I just very briefly, it's, it's uh, as I said, like the Rage song is particular to a joke and a, a little sequence we wrote. Um, other times I would have a, a scene where I would say to John, All right, you know, here's what I'm thinking, the mood I like. Um, you know, I want something from today. Uh, and, you know, I give him some some parameters around that. And I say, I, I don't need to, I'm not asking for a specific song. Uh, and then John will come back and say, you know, here's, eight, 10 choices, what do you think? And then we kind of went on it down. I said, well, these three kind of feel right. They don't feel exactly right. And now he's kind of narrowed it down to the, the mood that I'm looking for in the scene. And then we'll, we'll, we'll end up with uh, a song at the end. And it could be an independent artist. It could be, uh, it could be a very well-known song. And sometimes, obviously, those are much more expensive. So we may shy away from those, uh, depending where we are budget-wise in a given episode. But um, sometimes it's, it's just a feel for a scene. And sometimes it... it underplays a particular joke and it's very specific. Talking about the collaborative process between a producer and the music supervisor, how important is it to be honest of like, you know, I really want this song and or being like, no, this song just isn't gonna fit right. Like, yeah, talk about that relationship and that. Do you wanna start? Who uh, wants to start? I can start. Like, um, with Jason Kadams, who just has impeccable taste in music and, um, you know, knows what he wants. Um, I, I mean, I, I feel like, yeah, that's our job is to like, is to navigate the world of licensing to get Jason, uh, what he wants. Um, uh, wait, what was I going to say? Um, the question. Oh, the, oh, the, uh, oh, being honest, right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I mean, like, I, I feel like um, as long as you you are honest in the beginning, like when I get the ideas either from the script or or from from Jason or from the editors of like, I want this, I, I love this song, you know, I just, yeah, honesty up front is, is definitely super, super important. Like, here's my experience with this. Um, you know, Frank Ocean apparently never clears, um, but but I'm just giving you that as a historical, but we're going to go for it. And we are going to try 
and then you never know because we just got a Frank Ocean song, you know? And so, so you have to be honest. And do you mean creatively or, or money, about budgets and money and stuff? Creatively. Um, oh, creatively, I feel like, um, unless it's a really, really, you know, bad idea or it's just going to make Jason look bad, you know, I, I pretty much protect his ideas, you know. Um, I, I, I will be very honest if I think it's just going down the wrong way, but that never happens with Jason. So. And then there's also the things where a publisher or a label say, no, no, you're not going to get that. And then it's like, okay, well, do you accept that no? Or do you have perhaps no. a relationship with the manager and maybe you get the manager yeah. a clip and maybe a letter from Jason to say, yeah. hey, here's why I love your music and here's why I wrote this scene and I thought about your music. So you give them a more creative uh, togetherness, to, you know? I think that works so often, John McHugh. Um, you know, there are so many legendary artists that are just, they, they never license and, you know, stay away. But if you write that letter or if you you know, go that extra mile, I feel like it, it can often happen. So yeah, you I, have to be per persevering. You have to just try. And there's no, they can't hurt to try. You yeah, know? I mean, it, I think it's a really, a big part of our job is to manage expectations the yeah. same way the UPM isn't going to let you have 5,000 extras when you might only be allowed 1,000. So I do what I can to manage expectations. If I really... If I know I have a licensing history with somebody and it's difficult and it might not happen, it's my job to make sure in the time frame that I'm supposed to have something cleared to give NK a heads up about whether it's possible or not. I'm, I'm honest about that with her, with my editors. Um, I will refrain from saying I don't like somebody's idea. I will just politely offer an alternative idea. Like oftentimes... You know, we struggle with, you know, during the various cuts that people may insert music that they've not, production is not received from me. And I have to very politely deal with that. And so sometimes, you know, I can't say that I don't like what someone's put in the cut of a project, but I could send a playlist, <laughs> you know. She does um, send very sweetly worded emails that I'll literally reply and be like, Madonna, it's okay to be like, you can't do that. <laughs> I was like, like it's, I read between the lines, and don't worry, no one's trying to put Beyonce on there. We just needed a temporary track for it to go to the studio while you look at other stuff. Like, we're not crazy. Um, but yes, it is. And she's always very polite about it. But you will definitely know where she stands on the choice. <laughs> Don't send the cut to the network with that in it. Like, like what? It's a placeholder. I'm like, no. Um, so let's, sorry, go ahead. And lastly, speaking of honesty, um, to throw back to what I was saying about what it is to have Spencer, one of the things that keeps me honest is not only who he is, but the environments on our show keep us really honest because. A lot of them are the real places that, and Spencer can speak to this, that he spent time in. So when I'm trying to create a sound for somewhere, it's a real place. I have to be honest. And you should talk about, I mean, the community center breaks my heart every time we talk about it. And the swings. Yeah, those, you know, for All American, there's a handful of scenes where uh, you know, whether it's Spencer and Coop or Spencer and Sean in a few scenes, those are the same swings that I swung on when I was a kid. You know, that park is where I played all of my Little League sports from age three to when I went to high school. So uh, as well as the barbershop that's, you know, heavily influenced in season one. There's a lot that, you know, my childhood has leaned on when it comes to, you know, being portrayed in All-American. So to now have a soundtrack to, you know, my childhood is it's insane to me. And it's all because of, you know, these two wonders right here. We have, and we have to keep it honest. That's another form of honesty that we honor in our, we're not a crew, we're a family, just for the. <laughs> uh, so for the producers, you know, talk about your timeline. So when you're looking for a music supervisor, right? You know, what do you, what do you look for in a music supervisor and, and where do they come in? Like from start to, to finish, talk about your timeline. There. 
Sure. Well, I mean, it normally it it it, it typically the the timeline typically is is similar to the timeline uh, of post production. You know, you're you're really starting while there are, is some stuff that you're doing ahead of time. Uh, certainly when there's something in the script that you feel like you're really sure that you want to use that, you can start earlier if you know it's going to be challenging to clear something. But usually um, it, it, it comes down to like when you, when you are um, in, when you're in post-production, when you're editing the episodes um, is when you're doing a lot of the work where with Liza, where she's, um, you know, watching cuts, but even before she watches cuts, she's reading the scripts and sending pitches to me, sending pitches to the editors. Um, and, and it would, you know, start when post starts, which is right around when shooting starts and go all the way through the end of the, I think the lion, the most of the work is, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, as you're editing them, as you're editing each episode, but you know, the, we would, it would continue through, uh, you know, every mix. So it's, you know, I mean, I think typically that period of time would be however, however many months that is, but I think that the, that the music supervisor I would depend upon to be there from all the way through, take it all the way through the, from the very beginning of pitching songs to putting them in, trying out different um, <clears throat> cues in different spots all the way through uh, when we watch it in the mix. Yeah, and I would say for animation, it's it's um, kind of a nine month process from beginning to end. But um, you know, again, if it's something specific to the to the script, where I say I really I know I want this song in there, I think I'm really going to want this song in there. Get John a heads up. Let's start looking at it. Let's just see if he goes. Look, this thing is never going to happen. Then I can at least rewrite it at that point. But the most of the work comes in when we get what they call the uh, the colorized version back, where it's 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 almost. Don, we haven't done the uh, post work yet, but we'll sit down with with John uh, as music supervisor, and then we'll also sit down with a composer and sit in the same room and go, "Is a you know we want an original song? You know, do you want the composer to create a, a moment here, or do we want John to find a song for something here?" Um, and the reason usually we wait until that moment is sometimes John doing doing his job uh, very well will call me th two months before and say, "Hey, I've read this script, and I know you got this scene." And I'm thinking this this song will be great for it. And I go, John, to be honest with you, when we get that color back, I may cut that scene. I may edit that scene down that there's no room for a song. So um, we don't need to get ahead of the work yet. So most of it happens when we get the color back, and then we really know this is the this is kind of the version of the piece of clay that's going to take us to the finish line. Yeah, on all, on all American, we. Um... We tend to, Madonna and I sort of, we communicate a lot. And it actually, because not only do we have live musical performances on the show and, you know, especially in season two, one of our main character storyline is her pursuit of her music career. Um, and so Madonna is sort of very heavily involved from day one in terms of, you know, even at the start of season two, before we, the writers were even back, Madonna and I sat down and I was like, I'm doing the storyline for Coop. And we're going to want original music. So, you know, at that point, it was like, you know, let's talk to Breezy and see if she wants to write her own music. Let's talk to music producers and see, you know, Madonna had a lot of great suggestions for who could do the tracks. And, and from that point on, she was sort of involved on an episodic basis in production um, because there was so much live music being involved in the show. Um, and even in season one, truthfully, even though we didn't have... Um, Coop's character pursuing her music career in season one, there was still so, music is such a part of the show that there would be, you know, the the drill team band at the football games and that stuff would be, those are real drummers and we have them really do the tracks. And so Madonna would be involved right from pre-production on that. We had, you know, a gospel choir, a youth gospel choir at the church and Madonna is there on set making sure that no one is ad libbing anything she hasn't cleared oh. um, to make sure that we're getting the sound we want out of the choir. And so it ends up being, you know, um, like Jason said, this, you know, it really kicks in in post and we do spend a lot of time together on there once we're really working on the cuts. But because music is such a component of every episode of the show, Madonna is part of, you know, every sort of prep schedule has the phone call with Madonna scheduled with the director as part of our regular prep for every episode. We, uh, you haven't lived till you've got a call from NK going, I want to have a cotillion. And I was like... <laughs> 
what? I mean, part of the joy of the job is I love the fact that I don't know everything and the job gives me an opportunity to learn about things that I didn't know about. I may or may not have watched about 50 to 100 cotillions on YouTube trying to figure out, like, how are we going to do this in ours? And, you know, that was starting at, they were writing it. And I was like, I really can't screw this up. Like, this is a big moment. I, I have to find the song. My cast is going to dance to it. I mean, it's, and you better believe I was on there on set during the, as NK says, I was there at rehearsal. Like, uh, like I, I can't tell them how to dance, but I know the beats. I recut the music so it was the right length for the thing. I mean, we start early. I'm very lucky that they give me as much information as early as they can because nobody wants to see me fail. Yeah, that, that was that was such an amazing, it's so amazing um, just talking about, you know, hearing everything and how you all, you know, collaborate together. But let's talk about, I know we've got a lot of students, so let's talk about how you actually got your start um, as music supervisors. Um, Jonathan, let's start with you. I mean, I, was, I came from the record business. I was in the record, actually, I'm sorry, I was in the film business first, and I was working in the film business, but I was in marketing. And I met a woman there that did music, and I didn't realize there was a job like that. And she, one night, took me in the studio, and she was recording a song with the legendary Sam and Dave and John Cusack. And I was like, it was magic to me. It just blew my mind. And I was like, okay, I, figure, I have to figure out how to get into that side of the business. And as I was at a record company, uh, I was at AM Records and I pitched a job to basically be an in house um, music supervisor for the company and to pitch music. And while I was doing that, I just, um, my friend was producing a movie, he didn't have any money. And I said, look, I'll just give you what I can give you and I'll find independent artists and I'm happy to music supervise it. And that was that Cameron Diaz's second movie after The Mask, and it was my first movie. So I, I started music supervising and I just loved it. Um, and I just kind of kept going from there. And that was, you know, and then I started producing soundtracks and I did hundred plus of those and uh, music supervised and just kind of kept going and going and going. And then, and then my boss, Toby Emmerich at um, a New Line started producing a movie that he wrote. And I was like, well, I want to produce movies. And then, you know, just kind of produced a number of different movies and TV shows. And then the last couple of years I started directing. So it's, it's kind of, for me, I, I, I say this to students because where you, you start out and where you end up are two different things and you think you're going to be one thing you think you're going to be this and you just never know where the road takes you so you have to just keep being open to all the possibilities and, and bless you madonna um and um <laughs> and just kind of go for it you know when you see things you want you just try to go take them as a new yorker you know that's the kind of attitude that you just don't stop until you get you know trying to get what you want so uh that's my short and long story <laughs> madonna you're next okay um I, when I moved to Los Angeles, I'm a ride or die Canadian. Um, I want, I knew I wanted to be in this industry and I had a love of music. I just wasn't aware that you could actually turn it into a career if you couldn't play an instrument or you couldn't sing. Like there was still a little corner of the world that you could be a part of. So I worked in a, I did a lot of production. I wanted to understand how things were made. Um, trivia. I worked as John Malkovich's assistant at one point. <laughs> <laughs> which I think prepared me for everything. Uh, and then I started working in commercials and music videos. And when I was working in music videos, my job was to help shepherd directors through the process of being handed a piece of music and creating something visual for it. And then my, my good friend, Jennifer Pikin was a supervisor and was saying that she was going to start her own company. I was like, can I, can I come and learn this from you? Because I feel like it's just going to be the reverse of what I've been doing. Instead, you're giving the usual and you're asked to put the music to it. And, you know, 21 years later, I haven't looked back. Um, and I just, I, it's just a very lucky thing that mm -hmm. I love music as much as I do and that I actually have an outlet that requires me to have zero talent. <laughs> <laughs> Liza? Okay. Um, let's see. I, I mean, I grew up in theater and dance, um, musical theater. I went to Interlochen, uh, which is a camp in Michigan in the summertime. And I, I you know, I, I did operetta. And 
Um, and then, you know, I, I, in college, I majored in theater and dance, and that was always my passion was to be performing. And then after I graduated from college, I, I, I was afraid of, of performing. So I, um, I somehow got a radio show. I, if somebody just like said, here, try this. It was like two in the morning. I've been doing that ever since. Um, that was a very, very long time ago. But through all that, you know, those different passions of like going to see shows every every night or five shows a night, you know. And I've had various jobs in the music industry. Like I I I tried A and R for a while in the 90s, and I um, you know, I really wanted to be an A and R person, but that didn't work out. And so um, and then as a DJ on KCRW. You know, I just, um, at, at one point, oh, I wanted the music director spot so badly. That was my life's goal. And I didn't get it. And it, it was a blessing because I was just forced to like, oh, how am I going to make a living, you know? Um, so I thought I'll try voiceover and I'll try this thing called music supervision that like, I had a spoken word show featuring poetry on KCRW. And so somebody introduced me to a director, Mark Pellington, who was making a documentary on poetry. And that was the beginning. And then along the way, I met the wonderful Jason Kadams who gave me my first TV show. And anyway, I mean, that's how I got started. Everybody has a different path and, and everybody has a different story. And I usually tell young people that like, um, I think the best way to learn is like, kind of like Madonna because um, trying to like work for somebody else to get started, um, or, or, or supervise a friend of yours, uh, like a film, like a student film. Maybe you have a friend who is, I mean, I don't know exactly who's on the, the, the Zoom call today, but I um, just trying to do anything to, to, to get started. There's, there's no set way or set path to it. Yeah. I do, I mean, Let's talk about your relationship with Jason and Parenthood. And, you know, it's such a beloved show and it's so multi-generational. So talk about what he said to you about the music for that and what you both did to make it, you know, so widely appealing. Well, should Jason start maybe? You start, you start. You start. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so, I mean, we had worked together on Friday Night Lights. Um, You want to talk about Parenthood specifically? You can talk about, let's start with Friday Night Lights and then we'll go into... Well, for Friday Night Lights, I mean, like I said, I had very little experience in television, but I was a cheerleader in high school. (laughs) I was around the football team. Um, I, 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 I went to college in Texas and um, those three things... Those three experiences, when I read, or sorry, I watched the pilot because Peter Berg sent me the pilot for Friday Night Lights that had already been shot and they were looking for a music supervisor for the series. So I just immediately, you know, I had only done film and I just immediately freaked out over this pilot because it was just so incredible. And I just thought, I've got all the components. <laughs> I lived in Texas. I, I, I was this person in high school. I mean, that was sort I could relate. And I just thought, I've got to, I've got to get this, you know. And I, I just put together a compilation of music that I felt was representative of that world. And um, somehow, I, Jason liked it. But, I mean, my vision of it, which then later, I... I, I I mean, Jason, we explored so much. I mean, it was a combination, plus I had seen the movie, but a combination of hard rock, hip hop, definitely country and Western, but also indie singer songwriter that we would use emotionally for, you know, montages and, and, and background and stuff. And, and I think that was the essence and the, and the idea of Texas. Was hey, Liza, really cool. uh, Liza, jumping in and checking the chat room on some questions. One about Parenthood, I'm sorry, about uh, Friday Night Lights was, one, why did you guys decide to use Explosions in the Skies as opposed to traditional composer? And talk about how Devil Town, which became a kind of a yeah. classic off the show, made it into the show. So, I mean, I'm going to toss it to Jason. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the Explosions was somebody that, that came along with the, the film that Pete Bird directed. Right, Jason, go ahead. Yeah, so Explosions is definitely, Explosions guy is definitely a key piece of the of Friday Night Lights. And it's just, um, you know, um, it 
was used in the in the movie and we continued to use in the show and we were lucky to be able to continue to use in the show. And we also had a score that was uh, our composer, uh, our composers on the show also, um, you know, created a score that was had was inspired by explosions. So there was that feeling that I think um, the music in the show just had at its uh, um, that 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 was unique to the show. That um, was um, <clears throat> something that to me didn't feel like any other show. Um, that was exciting to me. And um, the Devil Town was like an interesting, um, um, you know, kind of thing to to bring up. That song was we use it in the end of the second episode of the show. And you know, when you're doing. Uh, to any show that you do, you know, like the 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 beginning of it, that fir- this first handful of episodes and the first season, you know, there's so many things that are. That's when you're defining it. You're defining it in terms of the what the actors are bringing and what you're doing as a writer. But certainly musically, you're de- you know, defining so much about the show. And Devil Town was this key moment for of of, of a song use <clears throat> for me because it was a song that worked great um, in, in it, but it was a song that was, you know, so much about, it's so much just like promised so much for what the show was going to be about, because in one way it was going to be about the sort of the beauty of that, of this small, of the of football in the small town, but it was also not shying away from the ugliness of, of a, of, of the, of, the ad- of what happens when uh, around the adoration of these high school um, athletes and and you know and um, the the devil town was like both beautiful and it was a little bit scary and um, and it was a real breakthrough moment musically and I feel like in shows you know I think that kind of happens in different shows and 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 it won't, and when that happens those songs kind of become sort of a North Star, like, you know, while you don't use that song again, necessarily, although we did reprise Devil Town seasons later, you kind of say, okay, um, there was, that's how we use, that it was how it was used in that moment and what it became did. Our DNA. What's it, it becomes part of the DNA and part of the culture of it. And, um, and there's, and, and, it, and that song became sort of a, a touchstone, I think, for the show. And as Liza was saying, with Friday Night Lights, what was so cool about the show was there was so much to lean into. There was the Texas of it, the country songs. There was the sort of like the 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 the, the sort of um, wildness of the of the sort of adolescent world. There was the fact that we were playing the show in a way that was almost like sort of um, sort of documentary like. Like we really wanted to make it feel like you were dropped down into this place, and music was a big part of supporting that. The music that they listened to um, felt real. You know, when you went into different people's homes, it felt like it felt like accurate and appropriate to those places, and that was really exciting. But I think the thing that was most exciting was, for to me, <clears throat> were when songs were used in emotional ways, and that's always it's always what makes me most excited about the collaboration with Liza and the use of you know um, songs in, in in television is when you that when the music does something that words can't do you know that there are no words in the world are going to be able to give you this visceral feeling um um when you combine it with the visual when you combine it with the images and that's what's kind of like so you know um exci- you know i that's that this part of the process is definitely the most uh one of the, one of the most fun parts of it and one of the most satisfying because it's like when you find that moment, it's sort of and that when you find that song, um, you know the way it can the way it can elevate the material is just it's just like um, so it's always such a surprise and it's always so wonderful. Yeah. Hey, Jazz is the keeper of the time. I just wanted to see we do one more chat room question uh, for the showrunners, then we could um, we have a special surprise. I think that might might happen. We'll see um, for the showrunners. Um, for NK and Jason, maybe and Alan, um, the question on the time, uh, the um, chat room is obviously this period of time we're living in is a crazy one, and obviously TV a lot of times reflects what goes on. 
do you see in your future stories, or maybe not this show as you're working on, but future stories that you would utilize the COVID moment in time and the pandemic as part of your stories? Talk about that for a second. Um, honestly, it, it depends. Obviously, uh, it's something we're talking about a lot right now because we're right in the middle of our season and it's a question of, do you address it? Do you not? Um, and, and you know, we've, we've gone back and forth in it. My personal belief, um, I actually have a whole call with the studio about this next week, but my personal, I, I look at TV for escapism. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was that for me when I was growing up. It's still that for me now in the minute I use it to escape sort of the craziness in the world that I don't want to deal with. And right now the craziness in the world is the zombie apocalypse is happening. And I can't fathom as a TV viewer wanting to tune in and watch these characters that I, I love who are in their senior year of high school. And it's supposed to be like all this stuff happening, um, sort of deal with the fallout of that yet. Um, the beauty of our show is our seasons are, we, our years in high school straddle two seasons. So they will be seniors for the next two seasons, um, which does allow us time to see the world return to whatever the new normal is going to look like. And then for us to process how we then incorporate that into the show. Um, but it's a constant ongoing discussion. It's a constant moving target. Um, and uh, one thing we do pride ourselves on very much on the show is rep authentically representing the world that these teens live in and how much it mirrors, you know, my son's world, other teenagers' worlds. And the truth is, especially for seniors, that COVID-19 really impacted them. I mean, there's like athletic championships are canceled, proms canceled, graduations canceled, like all of these culminating things after you've worked so hard are canceled. And the truth of living with that is just so um, devastating that I, I, I feel like we'd be doing a disservice not to pay homage to that in some way, shape or form. Um, I just don't know that it has to be that our, the entire show's world then gets plunged into a pandemic because truthfully, you can't play football that way. Um, <laughs> uh, so it sort of changes the season a little bit. Um, but it is, a, it is a moving target. It is an ongoing discussion. It is very much all of us sort of paying attention to what is happening in the world and what that new normal is going to look like when we're on the other side of this and seeing how we can um, incorporate that into our TV world. Jason, your thoughts? Alan? Yeah, I, I, I agree with NK and the, you know, what the TV is escapism, especially for a show like ours, which is comedy. Um, you know, obviously, as I said, we have a night, we have a we have a lead time, a uh, nine month lead time. So a lot of times we can't be as topical as we want. We can we can make some last minute changes, but I don't I don't foresee really, especially in a comedy, um, talking too much about it. Uh, as John alluded to a little bit earlier, we have these four little mini episodes that are kind of promotional pieces that are going to go on before the series airs. Uh, we might, in one of those, uh, reference it uh, in a minor way uh, and hopefully in a lighthearted way um, to bring laugh to, to people. But um, it wouldn't be uh, about what one of the minis is completely about, and uh, certainly it wouldn't. I don't. I don't foresee doing an episode out down the road. Um, uh, probably just keep it keep it light and keep it uh, comedic. Jason, I mean, yeah, I think that there will be times when there will be. Um, I, I'm sure there will be things that will directly talk about it and directly be about it. There have to be, um, and I'm sure it's going to seep its way into our 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 everything that we do, whether we intend it to or not. I mean, it's just the the, the fact is we're writers and. And and artists and um, we're going to reflect what we're going to. It's going to it's going to seep in whether we want to or not. Um, the one thing I will say is since I'm right now um, the, the, the I'm really spending most of my time developing things from the very beginning. The thing that I am personally getting the most um, uh, that, that that's the most healing thing for me as I'm doing it is being able to go into another world, you know what I mean? As a writer, I'm able to go into, um, I'm able to um, escape in a sense into, um, into a world that <laughs> it's not the world that we're living in right now. And that's been there. That's been like sort of like, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's like a healing thing. And so um, um, I think that, you know, 
it's 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 hard to I think it's going to be something that um, we're all going to be, um, you know, kind of learning to we're going to be sort of growing up with it, you know, in a weird way and learning to understand what it had the effect that it's really having. And, and, you know, and I think that's okay. And I don't think anything, I don't think things need to literally be about that um, in order to, um, um, in order to sort of still be able to, um, you know, kind of reflect how it's kind of affected all of us. Thanks. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and thank you to this amazing panel. Um, I, before we go, we do have something special, but I want to talk about it first with Madonna and NK. Um, you know, Breezy's performance as Coop um, and that song, Don't Ask, was so beautiful. Talk about, you know, what went into that song and, yeah, bringing that into the show. Well, we, um, it was, uh, it was always something we'd planned to do. And I, I talked to Madonna early on before we even started the writer's room for season two about the journey we were taking Coop on, mm -hmm. um, this, that season for season two and sort of how we wanted to kick it off. And the idea that she would use music as a way to finally get through to her mother, who she struggled with a lot in season one after she came out. And so once we, and so Madonna was already sort of on it in terms of like, okay, the music producers we can work with, all of that stuff. And then once we were got the script written, we were able to get it to Madonna in advance. Um, and we sort of just summed up the essence of what we wanted the song to be and reflect um, and really left it up to Breezy and Madonna to sort of come up with the specifics. And then there'd be a lot of back and forth of, you know, Breezy would send us lyrics and be like, does this work? And I have to say, I mean, the first set of <laughs> lyrics Breezy sent us, and I was just like, what? Are, like, it was so spot on as if she'd been in my head. Um, but of course, it's her life. So of course, it, why wouldn't it be spot on? It was just so, it was amazing to see that come to life. And then with the tracks that Madonna had worked with the Mac Club and to see it all came together, like I was... Musical talent is not something I possess. And if I could, you know, get a superpower, that's the one I would want. Um, and so it was it, for me, even as a showrunner, to have had the kernel of an idea and see how they brought it to life was just on a completely, a whole other level. Yeah, it was, it was a real gift because we had had season one to have a peek into Coop's story and her relationship with her mother and, and, you know, you could see that there was this struggle of her trying to live her truth and her true self and her mother just wasn't open to it. So the, that those seeds had been planted. And so when it came time to put that story and that desire and that need to live your truth um, and that opportunity came up, it was so gorgeous to be able to talk to Breezy about it and to know that she wanted so much and possessed more knowledge than any of us to create the lyrics for the song, for it to be as authentic as it possibly could. I mean, we were all blown away. You could have heard a pin drop anytime any of us were hearing the first of it. Like you didn't even want to give a note. You were just like, shut up. This is not like done, done and dusted. It was, I mean, it's kind of incredible, but I feel like I'm going on about something that you, you all sort of, if you don't know it, you should probably hear. I think that's a great idea. So let's see what we can do. There's someone here who'd like to join us. Breezy, you know. Hey, Breezy. Hey. Hey, Breezy. All What's right, Breezy. On? We would can love you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We'd love for you to give everyone a little bit of a taste of what we were just talking about. What if I told you I was kind of different? And me not loving you for who you are, no, what exactly my intention? If I told you I was prolific, would you believe me or find it in your heart to receive me? If I told you I'm this way and I'm like, huh, would you still look me in my face? Would you say some things that make me run away? Would you tell me that I'm sinning? This ain't God's work. Baby, you ain't living. Should I change my ways and try to make you listen? If I turn suicidal, when I slip my wrist all on your holy Bible, would you turn your back or would you hold me tighter? If I'm laying in the hurts, would you cry because I never wore a skirt? Or you be mad because I didn't tell you first? And you don't ask, so I don't say none. 
You know, it's not my style to never say none. And you don't ask, so I don't say none. You know, it's not my style to never say none. What if I told you I ain't mean it? Would you believe it? What if I told you that I'm out here battling my demons? There's some things that you'll never understand, though. Like how most people where I'm from don't understand you. Like how most black boy joy get destroyed. That's by the same system you run to for the award. This little girl's without their father, ain't got no mama. This son's that's looking up to papa, cause he just want the higher honor. Well, hello, your honor. I know the line's blurred. I'm just a victim to a story, missing my words. Yeah. Yeah, Breezy. <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad. I'm really glad all of you guys like it. I'm glad Thank and I'm proud. I'm, I'm really proud and I'm happy that I was able to execute in a way that, you know, was was perfect for the show and so many kids across you know the united states and other countries relate to the song so much so it's definitely a, a big moment for me and i'm truly truly you know just thankful that we were able to send that message and it hit exactly where we thought it would yeah it's great uh i love the episode and it's just beautiful to see when music can be written into picture uh and have it executed like that i love the way you guys use the song across the whole you know, a good chunk of the episode and help even tell some other stories with some of the lyrics. So really beautifully done. And I want to thank you guys. Uh, having three weeks in a row, closing with music is a blessing because that's what we, you know, as music supervisors, that's what we love is music. That's why we're in this business. It ain't to get rich, but it's to enrich the lives of other people and to work with great people like Alan and, and Jason and, and Kay for all of us. So um, Jazz, you want to close us out? Next week, I'll just say we have a panel about uh, the Advertising Committee in New York. We'll be doing it. It's kind of about music supervising ads in the time of COVID. If you've noticed, there's a lot of companies doing um, PSAs and ads that focus on what's going on in the world and the healthcare workers. And obviously, behind the scenes are music supervisors clearing music for that. So we'll, we'll show some of those spots next week, hopefully, and talk to some of those people. Uh, look for you know, go to Mondo and go to the GMS and you'll have information on what that panel is going to be. But that's the last in our series next week, 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern time. So again, uh, thank you. And Jazz, you want to close out? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for having me. Thank you, Guild of Music Supervisors. Thank you, Madonna, Alan, NK, Spencer, Jason, Liza, and Breezy. Thank you for that amazing performance. Thank you, everybody, for tuning thank you. in. And please thank you. Sign up, thank you guys for having me. Please sign up to be a friend of the Guild. Go to the Guild of Music Supervisors website dot com, and uh, this way you'll get to know all the things we're doing. And uh, we have a you know another summer summer program we'll be working on in the near future. So thank you guys all for attending and thank spending you. 90, 78, 88 minutes with us. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Peace.